Okay, good late, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I know we're we're slightly ahead of time, but um, I think we might as well give it a start. Um, my name's John Gale. I'm the general manager of the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D program, and it's a pleasure to present on a gloomy afternoon in the United Kingdom, uh, another one in the late in the latest in a greenhouse gas it's a webinar series. For those of you that don't know the organization, um, we're a member-based organization. We have 35 members, both countries and companies from around the globe, and those members define our work programs. Uh, we're very much a member-led organization. We've been active since 1991, and we're very proud to be part of the IEA's energy technology networks. We're one of some 38 individual research outfits around the world that specializes in certain topic areas. And ours is greenhouse gas mitigation from the use of fossil fuels in the power generation and, and large industry sectors. We're very much a technical organization. We don't attempt to define policy. We allow our members to define their own policy based on the information we provide them. We launched this webinar series this year with the deliberate intent of presenting more broadly our own technical work in the area. Um, we're doing this through, through presentations of some individual studies, but also cumulative learnings from, some, from several of the studies we do uh, on specific topic areas. And, and you can find the details of, the web, of all our details and activities on our website at www.ieaghg.org. Now, in terms of the webinar series themselves, I say this is now the fourth in the series. Um, the first on industry CCS challenges was a cumulative one. We looked at several different industries, uh, both steel, cement, uh, pulp and paper, and we, we brought some cumulative learnings from those. Um, we presented a, paper, a webinar on the status of biomass and CCS. Um, this is a review paper that we presented uh, that was published in the International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control and one that was published by my own colleague, Dr. Yasmin Kemper. We've recently done an update on developments in offshore monitoring, and now I'm very pleased to actually present or be here to present the fourth in the series, which is the cumulative learnings from the first year of operation of the integrated CCS project at Boundary Dam. As many of you know, Boundary Dam was the first power plant CCS demonstration plant to start up last year. And being a first of a kind, there's lots and lots of learnings from that plant. And we're very, very appreciative that Saskatchewan Power have worked with us to actually develop and produce a report on these activities, which my old friend and colleague, Dr. Carolyn Preston, who was the author of this report, is going to present to you in a few minutes. Carolyn and I have known for many, many years now. Um, we first met up when she was the CEO of the Petroleum Technology Research Centre in Regina, Saskatchewan. And uh, she was instrumental there in helping us set up the IEA GHG Waven Mydale CO2 Monitoring and Storage Project. Um, that was our first big foray into... Oh, it's one of the one of the first big forays into a, into integrated monitoring of a, at a, a site, at a storage site in in North America. It was an onshore project, uh, injecting CO2 into the Waven oil field. It was a CO2 oil flood, and at that time, it was one of only two major CCS demonstration projects around the world. The other one being Sightner, which we were also involved in. But coming right up to date now, Carolyn is a professional engineer professional chemist. She's took her BSc in chemistry at the Queen's University of Kingston and since did a PhD at the University of Toronto. She now runs her own consulting business in, Cal in Calgary and I say work where she supports industry making sustainable energy and water technology choices. And we were very mm. pleased that Caroline was able to, to do this report for us and I think you will find that the outcome of this report is, is an excellent piece of work. So I'll hand you over to Caroline directly. Well, good, uh, good morning, everybody, from a different continent. Um, you should see my presentation start up in a second. There we go. 
Um, so I'm uh, going to talk to you at a very high level about a 104-page report that I wrote uh, over the summer about the first year of the SAS Power Boundary Dam Power, uh, Power Stations Integrated CCS Project. I do cover the history of uh, SAS Power getting to the point of deploying um, uh, post-combustion capture on the power plant, uh, and actually the one unit at the power plant. Um, so uh, if you want to read about the details, I suggest you read the report or even the executive summary. Um, I will give you a little bit different flavor than the report in uh, this morning's presentation. So I'll start off. Um, it was an honor to author this report on the Boundary Dam CCS project. Uh, I'm indebted to SASC Power, uh, U.S. Department of Energy, and the IEA GHG for engaging me to write the report. In a single sentence, this project was an amazing accomplishment. And I'm happy to share some of the story with you, but I cannot take credit for any of the success of the project. I merely wrote about it. As an author, it was my goal to bring together the bits and pieces of a truly complex puzzle which was shared with me by some of the key engineers through interviews in which I basically explored the typical uh, newsman's five W's, what, when, where, why, and how. And then the trick was to pull it all together in a report. The story of this project includes many firsts and new features in the power plant. The integrated carbon capture and storage project at SAS Power's Boundary Dam Power Station stands as a successful major step forward towards sustainable power generation. The project exemplifies the bold steps we must make as a society in order to reduce our negative impact on the world's environment. What I hope to do for you today is to give you a sense of how the technical, business, regulatory, and operations pieces fit together from a high-level perspective. I will highlight some things I learned about the project and the team as a summary, but as I said before, please read the report to learn more about the remarkable details. I have spent my career in oil and gas R&D and commercial engineering and innovation. As I interviewed the principals behind this project, I was struck by a keen sense that this was much more than a, simply a nuts and bolts engineering project. The project is a story of challenges, opportunities, determination, boldness, passion, and excitement. All of this energy came across to me loud and clear during the interviews. It was a wonderful experience to talk with the team about their work. In fact, their enthusiasm was infectious. They are very proud of their accomplishment, but it is business as usual as they move forward with planning the next power plant in SAS Power's fleet. I'm going to begin with a little bit of a background about SAS Power. Some of you will know about it and some of you won't. I will talk a little bit then about um, the situation for power generation and regulation in Saskatchewan and Canada. SAS Power's generating capacity is just over 4 gigawatts. SAS Power provides electricity to approximately 1.2 million citizens and to commercial customers. It also exports some power to Alberta. SAS Power's generation is mainly comprised of coal, natural gas, and hydropower, but there's also the highest density of wind power in Canada, located primarily in the southwestern part of the province around Swift Current. SAS Power's coal fleet is located in the southeast part of the province. It coincides with the ma massive Ravenscrag lignite coal formation that lies near the surface and is amenable to inexpensive surface mining. As of 2007, when SAS Power began contemplating carbon capture, the operating fleet dated back to 1959. Uh, I, I should note that there were a lot of coal-fired power plants prior to this, but they had been long since been decommissioned. Boundary Dam is the oldest of these power plants. It is comprised of six units totaling a nominal 800 megawatts, and you can see here the dates of their construction. Units one and two were shut down in 2012 and 2013, respectively, due to their age and inability to easily convert to carbon capture and storage. Unit 3 was converted and is the subject of this report. Poplar River, 
which is located in this south central part of the province, is comprised of two units that total a nominal 600 megawatts. And Shand is located near Boundary Dam. It's the newest unit constructed in 1993 and is a nominal 300 megawatts. Pictured here is a typical modern coal-fired power plant that roughly represents what SAS Power has installed with the exception of environmental controls shown in the center of the graphic right here. Um, in Canada, pollut pollution mitigation technology required at each coal-fired power installation depends upon the date of installation and those technologies have typically been grandfathered. This is not the case, however, for GHG mitigation measures, as you will hear shortly. So, for instance, the older power units of Boundary Dam only have fly ash precipitation capture technology, while the newer Shand unit has mercury control technology installed. None of the SAS power coal units included have included uh, NOx and SO2 emissions control until the retrofit at Boundary Dam 3. So setting the context, as I promised, I'm going to give you a brief little snapshot about uh, Saskatchewan and Canada, and including the regulatory situation for greenhouse gas emissions. So SAS Power's uh, GDP um, is shown here. Uh, as previously stated, the, the province has a relatively small population for its land area, totaling about 1.2 million people. Most of them live in the southern two-thirds of the province. In fact, there are no paved roads in the top one-third of the province, so the northern one-third of the province. Its GDP was approximately 60 billion Canadian in 2014, that's in 2007 dollars. The economy is diverse with more than half of the GDP attributable to value-added services. This was somewhat of a surprise to me, actually, because Saskatchewan has vast natural resources and is the second largest oil and gas producer in Canada with most of its production being exported to the United States. It also has a very, very large, uh, high concentrated uranium resource. Um, here, shown here is a breakdown of Saskatchewan's GHG emissions. Given the importance of the mining and oil and gas sectors on the province's GDP, it is unsurprising that the single largest contributor to GHG emissions can be attributed accordingly. The power generation sector contributed roughly one-fifth of the GHG emissions as of 2012, or approximately 16 million metric tons per year. This is equal to the contribution from transportation emissions. Canada has, also has a diverse power generation mix. More than half of the nation's power comes from hydro, followed by coal-fired power generation. That's because in um, Ontario, Quebec, and BC, there is a lot of water. Uh, total power generating capacity was 611 terawatt hours in 2013 for a population of 35.2 million people and a GDP per capita of 52,000 US dollars. Canada's GHG uh, emissions are shown here in this graphic. Canada's GDP is heavily dependent on, upon its natural resources. Therefore, it's not that surprising that the energy and transportation sectors to get product out of the, uh, the country contributed more than half of Canada's total GHG emissions, which were approximately 700 million metric tons in 2012. Electric electricity generation contributed approximately 14% to the GHG emissions for the nation, or approximately 100 million metric tons in 2012. This is slightly lower than for Saskatchewan due to the ready access to hydroelectric power in eastern Canada and BC. In September 2012, GHG regulation for coal-fired power plants was enacted in Canada that came into force on July 1st of this year, 2015. You can see some of the details here on this slide. The performance standard was set at a level strict, uh, slightly, slightly stricter than Europe at 420 uh, metric tons per gigawatt hour. The end of life for existing coal-fired power plants varies depending upon the date of installation, but nothing is grandfathered. All coal-fired power plants fall under this regulation. Generally, carbon capture and storage must be implemented using the schedule shown for power plants as they approach 45 to 50 years of age. 
newer power plants must be converted by 50 years of age. Any power plant for which CCS construction plans have not been filed with the government by 2020 must be shut down by their end of life. Shown here, you can see um, the anticipated Canadian coal fleet reduction from 2007 onward. It's anticipated that the coal power fleet in Canada will be dramatically reduced by 2040 to about one-sixth of the fleet size from 2007. You will see uh, quite a steep drop uh, in this time period here, and that's due to a voluntary shutdown of all the coal-fired power plants in Ontario in favour of nuclear and hydropower. Uh, there are some added benefits to carbon capture and storage shown in, this, in these two graphs here. Implementing um, the technologies associated with CCS will result in significant reductions in NOx, SO2, and PM10 and PM2.5 particulates. So on to the project conducted by SAS Power. Any project team needs the key ingredients to assure its success. SAS Power has, was no exception as it embarked on this project. I would rate SAS Power as being a remarkable pioneer. As someone who has worked on technology development and commercialization in the energy industry for over 25 years, I was amazed that SAS Power, being such a small company, had the fortitude and boldness to build and operate a carbon capture plant using a technology with no full-scale operating history. Most energy companies will only build infrastructure based on a technology that has a stellar operating history of one or two decades. We often hear cries for more innovation at a faster pace, but we rarely see that happen in the face of the realities, timing and obstacles that arise in most projects. This project is truly a remarkable accomplishment and demonstrates an organization with a pioneering spirit. It really is a made in Saskatchewan success story. A, techno a solid technology foundation. SAS Power has began investing in carbon capture and storage in the mid-1980s when two pivotal events occurred. Oil fields in southeastern Saskatchewan were becoming depleted and CO2 EOR looked like an applicable technology to boost production. You should recall that EOR had been working well in West Texas for about a decade by this time. It was a becoming apparent Additionally, that the world's climate was being negatively impacted by industrial activity, with the main culprit being a combustion of fossil fuels such as coal to produce power. If CO2 could be captured from power plant emissions in southeastern Saskatchewan, such as the Boundary Dam power station, it could be used to enhance oil recovery. A lot of effort and funding was required to A, develop reliable capture technology and drive down its costs, and B, to prove that CO2 could be stored geologically in oil reservoirs and then deep saline reservoirs and would result in permanent storage that was a safe practice to assure the public that this was the right thing to do. SAS Power's timeline is shown here. Um, you can see that SAS Power made major investments in technology development development both independently and in collaboration with other organizations and companies um, over a 30-year period before beginning the CCS Boundary Dam um, project. A supportive shareholder. The shareholders in Saskatchewan are the government of Saskatchewan and the people of Saskatchewan because it's a publicly owned entity. Over the period 1985 to 2015 and beyond, the Government of Saskatchewan has been supportive and has provided funds to invest in proving and commercializing carbon capture and storage. Given the role of CO2 to enhance oil recovery and thereby assure the longevity of the oil industry in southeastern Saskatchewan, the public has become comfortable with the notion of injecting CO2 underground and supporting a solid environmental approach such as uh, CCS is particularly easy when it supports the local economy. It's kind of a no-brainer for the local public. A committed team. The SAS Power team demonstrated to me that a focus on providing the customer with stable and effect cost-effective power is ingrained in their culture and in every aspect of their daily work. 
Keeping the cost of infrastructure investment down is a priority in planning a major infrastructure project because it goes toward assuring lower life cycle costs of electricity, which is passed on to the consumer in electricity pricing. So don't believe anybody who says that SAS Power had the money just to do this, just to try it. They did it because it made good economic sense. The team worked many long hours, days, weeks, months, and years to deliver the project. Whatever challenge was thrown at them was met with dedication to coming up with the best possible solution for the shareholders. The challenges. Significant challenges were thrown at the team as they sought to achieve their goal to commercialize carbon capture. The first big challenge was technology choice. At the outset of the first thinking about adding carbon capture to a coal-fired power plant, the technology gaps were staggering. These were not the incremental gaps we normally encounter at the beginning of a ma major infrastructure investment decision. Which CCS technology would be the best choice in terms of capital and operating costs, environmental impact, market price for CO2, flexibility in producing CO2, technology, sorry, technology maturity, etc. Do you choose a new build power plant or do you choose to retrofit an existing power plant? These decisions were particularly problematic because no commercial technology was available, hence the technical and investment risk was high. Several choices were considered in detail from technical and business perspectives. There were a lot of design iterations until the final doable technology could be selected. Managing risk. As you might appreciate, without a commercial technology, risk was pretty high. How do you effectively manage the risk that a process or technology will fail when it has no operating history? In other words, how do you assure performance of the power plant when you add carbon capture? SAS Power took the approach of managing tolerances on performance specifications for each major piece of equipment. And when they weren't comfortable with the risk that was presented, that there, there would be stable operation of a particular piece of equipment, they added redundancy to manage risk of performance uncertainty. In other words, they added another piece of equipment that was identical, that they could rely on. This leads to higher first-time commercialization costs because once the plant is operating, you will inev inevitably find you don't need some of that duplication. The higher cost of engineering the first time CCS retrofit design was covered by a one-time financial support from the federal government. Construction timing was actually pretty, not, not the best. I've heard SAS Power say that, you know, if they were, they were able to build the Boundary Dam VD3 retrofit now, they would actually be able to do it at a much lower cost because there's a lot more people available right now because of the, um, the price of oil has dropped so much. But at the time of construction, around 2011 through to 2014, there was a high level of oil and gas activity in Western Canada, particularly in the oil sands, and also a high competition for materials such as steel. Cost control was achieved through multiple vendors and hands-on management, and by parceling the construction into appropriate packages. Stakeholder engagement. A first-time project is under a microscope. It has its defenders and its detractors, even within the corporation's board of directors. Patience, fortitude, and skill is required to guide stakeholders through the process of building technology confidence. That is the confidence to agree that the choices made by the engineering team are the right choices to make. And of course, this is particularly problematic when there is no commercial technology for carbon capture to choose and nobody has retrofitted a power plant to work with carbon capture before. One way to steer stakeholders towards supporting the uh, engineering design choices of the team is to keep a variety of technology options open for an extended period of time to give the, stakeholder, the stakeholders the choices they need to get some, gain some comfort. In fact, the choices, these particular uh, choices or options were available to the decision makers right up until the time that construction was approved. Just before that approval, a third party review was initiated by the board of 
directors that proved out the business case and its associated design. The review was conducted by an investment firm out of Chicago. One important decision made early by the engineering team was that the power plant must generate power whether the capture plant was operating or not. That guided them to post-combustion capture. So if they were going to make this investment, the power plant had to work for sure. The capital cost of upgrading the power plant demanded that this be the case. It was quite a big chunk out of SAS Power's budget. This was a fortuitous decision because the stakeholders could more readily support operational flexibility, in other words, whether you have capture running or not, but you're always generating power, to enable the SAS Power Operations team to become skilled at operating the capture plant should its chemical processes be initially difficult to manage. Besides, think about it how comfortable are power engineers with managing chemistry. So this, this was a good approach. The business case. The, the business case for carbon capture and storage at Boundary Dam was made in late 2010 at a time when natural gas prices were high. The following is a snapshot of the essential components of the case to support the installation of CCS at, Boundary Dam, uh, at the Boundary Dam coal-fired power station, unit number three. Importance of byproducts. The business case of the BD3 ret retrofit lot relies very heavily on the sale of byproducts to offset the cost of capture. These byproducts are CO2 for enhanced oil recovery, sulfuric acid for fertilizer, and fly ash for cement manufacture. The EOR potential in Saskatchewan is shown here in light blue at the bottom uh, of the graphic or the, the south central to eastern part of the province, you will see the Williston Basin and some oil, pool, oil pools in there, notably the Weyburn Pool where the Weyburn Mydale CO2 Monitoring and Storage Project was conducted. You will also see in the hatched areas the lignite coal, so there's a coincidence of oil and coal here. And the EOR locations, of course, are not in the Bakken Formation. They are in um, the uh, Mydale beds. CO2 or EOR has been proven as a safe and acceptable means of geological storage of CO2 at, as a result of the 12-year-long IEA GHG Weyburn Mydale CO2 Monitoring and Storage Project. Details of that report can be found at the PTRC website. As you can see, there are significant oil resources that coincide with coal-fired power generation in southern Saskatchewan. But there is very little CO2 available to supply the demand coming from the conventional oil producers who are experiencing a decline in their production. This presents a golden opportunity for the future to support conversion of existing coal-fired power generation in the re region, provided, of course, the life cycle cost of electricity is comparable to competing alternatives such as natural gas combined cycle. This graph is shown for the purposes of illustration based on the scenarios contemplated in December 2010 when the business case was made in support of CCS at the Boundary Dam Unit Number 3. You can see that uh, coal-fired power with full CCS, CCS would lead to the greatest reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, you can actually see that NGCC is quite a bit higher at about 375 tons, which is interesting. Um, in December 2010, the cost of natural gas was high, as I stated previously, making CCS look like a cost-effective option. And you can see here that the cost of operating an NGCC unit relies very heavily upon the cost of the fuel whereas the cost of uh, a retrofitted carbon capture and storage coal-fired power plant mainly has its cost coming from its capital investment and the fuel cost is relatively low. So the cost of deploying CCS is significant, but it does make use of existing infrastructure and some there is a public benefit to reusing infrastructure rather than uh, decommissioning, it, decommissioning it. The cost of CCS retrofitting will, of course, decline over time with more operating history to refine its design and construction. It is certainly a sensible option to have within your portfolio coal-fired power in incorporating CCS to balance out electricity pricing in a particular power company's fleet 
when natural gas prices are high and NGCC units are expensive to operate. And of course, this is one of the drivers SAS Power had, was to be able to balance out the cost of their, their uh, power to their customers. Getting it all done. What were the key pieces of work before the integrated power unit was operational in October 2014? Shown here is a go, no go decision funnel that spans just over 10 years and that it demonstrates the time frame from the initial seeds of the idea of carbon capture at a SAS power coal fired power plant to the beginning of construction of the BD3 integrated CCS retrofit. This was the time from contemplating various types of carbon capture including uh, oxy fuel combustion and investing in technology de development in carbon capture and storage up to the point of commercializing the integrated CCS commercial scale operation. Selection criteria. Which technology would be the best choice in terms of capital and operating costs, ease of operation, robustness or stable performance with min uh, anticipated minimal issues, Operational flexibility, in other words, can you operate with and with, uh, without CO2 capture so that you're not held at ransom by the CO2 market. And the best way to integrate into the power grid. The best choice, of course, is the one that is most mature and has an engineering scalable data plus an analogous proven process. The choice came down to post-combustion capture using an amine solvent which would allow infrastructure costs to be reduced by retrofitting an existing facility and extending its life by a further 30 years. The technology chosen was Shell CanSolve's carbon capture process because it was very close to being commercially viable with a proven analogous SO2 amine solvent capture process that had already been successfully installed in several power plants around the globe. The power plant ret of of course had to be retrofitted to extend its life by 30 years in order to justify the capital investment in CCS. Um, it, in doing so, SAS Power chose to make the plant more efficient and, uh, and of course had to add additional infrastructure to integrate it with the capture plant. But they also um, decided that they absolutely had to minimize the parasitic losses associated with capture to maximize the power produced. It's kind of a given. So there were the, the various parts of the power plant retrofit included upgrading the boiler, which was done by Babcock and Wilcox, and it was upgraded to operate more efficiently at a higher temperature. Hitachi installed a new high efficiency steam turbine. And of course, there were all the details of integrating with the capture plant with uh, its associated complexities and the redundancies to reduce the risk that I stated before. And there were environmental considerations to take care of to improve the power plant. They had to uh, create a closed loop for fluids within the power plant so things such as oils didn't go back to the boundary dam reservoir. The site complication was that doing the retrofit uh, uh, in the center of a power plant uh, meant limited access and the aging infrastructure such a, uh, that led to issues such as lead, uh, paint and asbestos which posed a few problems along the way. So don't underestimate how complicated it is to um, renovate an old building. Moving manpower around the site was also complicated. Some uh, special elevators were installed that were then deconstructed. Lun a lunchroom was constructed at the top of the power plant, which was then taken down. Um, and attracting and retaining skilled manpower was complicated. As I stated before, the demand for labor in Western Canada was very high at this time. The capture plant um, schematic is shown here. This is the can solve process. SO2 scrubbing is required um, before the flue gas enters the um, CO2 absorber and that's because SO2 more effectively competes for the amine solvent than CO2 does, so it must be removed first. But this does give one an opportunity to remove con other contaminants from the flue gas before it enters the CO2 capture plant, which will reduce the risk of the CO2 capture plant not working. Sasbauer contemplated limestone forest oxidation scrubbing, which is an industry standard, but eliminated that as an option because 
The nearest source of limestone was a thousand kilometers away in the Alberta Rockies, and there was no demand for gyps rock in the province of Saskatchewan. Shell CanSolve's combined CO2 and SO2 capture system was ultimately chosen because it was a simpler uh, combined system and had writ uh, written performance guarantees from SNC-Lavalin, the EPC who constructed the power plant, the, sorry, the capture plant. Managing the details. As you can see, there were a lot of things to take care of during the project and the construction took place, as I indicated before, from the spring of 2011 until the um, early fall of 2014. It was a complex project to manage with many teams undertaking pieces of work such as safety and transition, and transition to operation. It was all very well coordinated, even though there were separate teams working on things. They all had a, a single goal in mind, power generation with reduced environmental impact. So what were the key learnings that will help SAS Power with this next power infrastructure project? And what learnings could help SAS Power's collaborative partners and stakeholders? Number one, the biggest learning of all in my view, was being focused. Priority number one was stable, cost-effective power supply, and priority number two was carbon capture and byproducts. So in other words, keep the end goal in mind. The major investment that was being made required that there be stable and cost-effective power supply, and the team never lost sight of that. But, you know, not that they did a bad job at all by any stretch of the imagination on carbon capture, but the power plant had to run first and foremost. Be bold. SAS Power chose a technology that wasn't commercially ready, but it was sufficiently close to commercial viability to be, success, uh, to be successful. This was new territory. Um, they did choose a technology that had sufficient piloting history that design engineers could test the operating parameters on paper with respect to overall integration with the power plant. But that did limit the number of uh, capture technologies they could choose from because they had to have that operating his that sorry that piloting history in order to be able to do the design on paper. But remember first. One very important thing, there was no regulation in place when SAS Power took the decision in late 2010, early 2011 to go ahead with CCS integration with the power plant. That regulation came into force in July 2015. Be energized by challenges. The team had staying power. It was absolutely determined to reach the goal line. Every team member put in an exemplary effort to complete the project and do the best job possible, no matter what extra challenges and additional work were encountered along the way. Each challenge was a major effort to overcome and it fell on the same small team to deliver. The leaders were followers and vice versa. What will the ne next project look like? I can state with great certainty. It will include the same type of capture technology so they can build upon uh, the learnings from the first uh, plant. And it will almost undoubtedly have a modular design to keep construction costs down. Be committed. The team was definitely overworked but determined to deliver as promises. Many wrenches or spanners were thrown at the team on their journey to the finish line. For instance, SAS Power is a public organization and it faces the challenge of an open procurement process. Each piece of equipment that was chosen by the procurement team would slightly change the overall design, which meant a lengthy and intensive iteration design process that took over two years. The team was thorough and committed to a successful project outcome. To quote Doug Deverne, the overall project manager, a key trait in every member of the team was a can-do attitude. Very Western Canadian expression. So this exemplary safety record says it all. They were all careful about safety, and, it, and this, this statistic actually blows me away. During the 4.5 million person hours of construction time, there were no lost time injuries. And of course, deliver as promised. The promise, the ability to generate power from coal in an environmentally responsible manner. The delivery, SAS Power delivered on that promise on October the 2nd, 2014, that day is, uh, there's a photo from that day shown here, 
um, with the premier in the picture and the minister responsible for SAS power and a minister from the government of Canada and the SAS power leadership. And on that day too, on October the 2nd, 2014, SAS power was immediately able to sell CO2 to Synovus for injection at their Weyburn oil field. Shown here is a picture of the capture plant, the SO2 uh, absorber tower on the left and the CO2 absorber tower on the right. And um, next is a shot of um, how the power breaks down for the power plant. When the power plant is operating without CO2 capture, it generates 161 megawatts. You may recall from an earlier graph that the original BD3 unit produced 139 megawatts. So there's more power being generated without uh, carbon capture. When the carbon capture is running, it currently generates 112 megawatts of power. However, the team believes over the next two to three years of, in, uh, of continual improvements, they will bring that power level up to 120 megawatts. The total investment was $1.467 billion. I'll remind you that about $240 million of that was additional engineering work associated with doing a first-time project that was paid for by the Government of Canada. Uh, you can see that the plant refurbishment uh, costs are relatively high, but if one were to choose a newer plant such as Shand, which already has more modern um, equipment in it and has more modern emission controls, and efficiency uh, inherent in the plant, these costs would be lower. CO2 capture costs will be reduced over time by eliminate, eliminating the unnecessary redundancy they discovered when the plant started operating. So some of those risk mitigation pieces of equipment are not necessary. The final number for the actual investment in the plant is still being adjusted downward as SAS Power negotiates with its vendors. This is normal for a big capital project. I have a few slides here that I'm going to go through relatively quickly because I don't want to focus on them, but they will be here for you to look at the YouTube channel later. Basically, the CO2 is being injected at um, the Weyburn oil field and also at the Aquastore um, CCS project, which is a nearby deep saline aquifer storage project. Here's a picture here of the drilling at the um, uh, Aquastore site. And here's a picture here of the increased oil production uh, over here associated with CO2 EOR. And of course, uh, SAS Power is providing more CO2 for that. D at a deeper uh, horizon, at 3.2 kilometers versus the 1.4 kilometers of Weyburn, uh, CO2 is being injected into Aquastore at a relatively slow rate. It started in April of this year. Here's a graph of the well design. And this is an interesting picture of a, a technician taking some measurements from a, from a stationary geophone. And in the background here, you can see the Boundary Dam power plant. So you can see that the Aquastore um, uh, geological storage site is very close to the power plant. And it, it has enough storage um, to last for decades. And shown here are some monitoring techniques. Again, I'm going to go through quickly. So the future of coal power. Would SAS Power deploy CCS again? Yes, but only if a compelling business case can be made that the life cycle cost of power would be comparable to alternatives such as NGCC. The business case for BD4 and BD5 is currently being developed. In fact, it began as soon as um, BD3 started operating again. Here is the very demanding retrofitting schedule facing SAS Power as a result of the re new regulations in Canada. And you can see why BD um, three and four um, must, sorry, four and five must be considered right now because they must be shut down by 2019 if a decision hasn't been made to retrofit them. Collaboration has been the foundation for SAS Power's success. There was technology collaboration in carbon capture and storage. Uh, there was collaboration with. SAS Power stakeholders, and there was collaboration with the associated off-taker industry that buys the products from SAS Power. The challenges one confronts in deploying CCS technologies are massive. They can only be confronted by working together, which is a clear learning from SAS Power's journey. Remember, shared risks and shared rewards are accomplished by working together. How can you learn from SAS Power? The SAS Power CCS Consortium is currently being uh, created 
This will enable you to quickly get up to speed and share the CCS journey in responsible fossil power generation with SAS Power. I encourage you to explore how you might collaborate with SAS Power by talking with Mike Mania, the president of CCS Initiatives at SAS Power, or any of the SAS Power CCS Initiatives team. You can uh, contact me if you like. My contact information is the, at the end of the presentation, and I can, if you don't know how to get a hold of them, I'll, I'll uh, make the introduction. Um, this report covers a three-decade journey made by SAS Power. I am privileged to have worked with an amazing and dedicated team to make this report a reality. From the report, I hope you will learn how SAS Power achieved the right to be recognized as a pioneer in successfully commercializing CCS for power generation. My role was relatively minor. Two days of interviews and three months of writing and editing, including legal review. I could have uh, not have accomplished this without the funding and support of those organizations shown here in bold or the exemplary dedication of the team shown here. And here is my contact information. Here is the contact information for the IEA GHG as well as a link to the report on the IEA GHG website. And now to questions. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Um, excellent presentation of an excellent report, um, but of course I'm extremely biased. Um, in all respects, um, we have had some questions coming through and uh, welcome to take any more in the time we have available. I think some of the questions you have sort of answered, we, one was early on was how much the natural gas price influenced the decision to continue with coal and CCS. I think you have answered that, but it might be worth yes. if you could just re-emphasize the, the decision point that was taken. Well, uh, the, the decision was made at a price when natural gas, at a time when nitro, natural gas was, in, was at a very high price in um, late 2010, early 2011. And so the cost of coal in comparison was much lower. But the overall cost of, of capital and operating for NGCC versus um, CCS at Boundary Dam, they were comparable. I won't say they're identical, but they're comparable. There are other benefits that SAS Power considered that are public benefits, such as um, uh, making CO2 available to EOR producers, and when oil is produced, there are royalties paid to the SAS Power government, so there's a benefit. There's also jobs created um, by uh, ensuring the uh, oil industry is maintained. Um, so that, there's that kind of thing taken into consideration. There was also in the back of SAS Power's mind was we have a 350 year long resource of coal and it would, it would be nice to be able to use it in a more environmentally responsible manner um, to keep the cost of electricity down when the price of natural gas goes up again, which it will. <laughs> Okay, um, I think some of the other questions are here again about costs again, and and we've seen quite a few issues related to cost saving in here. I think one you didn't mention was the labour costs at the time, which were extremely high because of the competition with the the oil industry in Alberta. Could you, would you like to comment yes. on that? Um. Yes, well, uh, at the time that the uh, Boundary Dam retrofit was underway, there was, there was a, a rapid expansion of the oil sands in the Fort McMurray area. There, were, there, were, there was also a lot of infill drilling and conventional, uh, the conventional oil industry in both Saskatchewan and Alberta um, in order to increase production because the price of oil was quite high. There, there was also, of course, the Bakken never stops being a, folk, a hive of very busy activity because um, the cost of production is not very high and it's a very light oil. So yes, um, uh, professionals and trades in the oil industry were being paid at very high rates in 20, uh, th 2011 through to 2014. But of course we've seen a slide in the price of oil to less than half of what it was in the summer of 2014 and consequently, a lot of trades and professionals have lost their jobs, and so they're willing to take much less money to work. Okay. Um, thank you. Another question that's just come through. Um, 
is on the parasitic load. Can you comment on the parasitic load from the compressor and, and that on the plant? Um, I'm sorry, I can't. That's proprietary. <laughs> as far as SAS Power is concerned, I can't comment on that. Okay, I have heard Mike present on that, but yes, you're probably right. Uh, we'll let him present on that at a later date. Um, uh, well, I can sh I can show the figure again, mind you. Where is it? There it is. So the the compression is is uh, quantified separately here. It's 15 mm -hmm. megawatts out of the 161, and the parasitic load associated um, with the capture that would be uh, reclaiming the sol the amine solvent and that sort of thing is 11 megawatts. Mm -hmm. Although they, I see on that slide they do have amine. No, they do. They do have amine generation separately. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've got something of an unfair question, I think, which is asking you to comment on the what's going on in terms of the debate within the Saturan government. I think at the moment, which I think is is a bit political for what we're. We're and, I, and, I, and I couldn't comment. I, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't live in Saskatchewan anymore. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't think we want to get into the, We're a technical group. We don't want to get into the... Yeah. the um, with that, uh, another question. Sorry, this is difficult to read. Will the carbon captured qualify for carbon credits in Canada? It's an interesting one. Well, there has been talk about having carbon credits in Canada for almost 15 years and it still hasn't happened. We do have carbon taxes in Alberta and British Columbia and in Alberta they're focused on large emitters such as this power station would be. So if if the same scenario existed in Saskatchewan, SAS Power would avoid a $25 a ton tax. That's all I can say. There is no there's no carbon trading system in Canada. Thanks. And I think one we should end on the question is, how do you see this project influencing, influencing sorry, uh, CCS deployment on a global scale? Well, I see this as providing, first of all, we, we, we know that aiming um, solvent capture will work. Um, it, it obviously needs to be fine-tuned to work better um, because there have been some issues with the capture plan, but it is running, not at full capacity, but it's running. So. SAS Power is willing to share quite a lot of their learnings. They, of course, there's, a, there's some proprietary stuff around the actual CanSolve technology itself. But I believe we'll, they, they, by virtue of their CCS consortium, they're willing to share and um, they want others to share with them. I also think on uh, Friday when we see the, the Shell Quest project start up, we'll, we'll also have yet another example at the same scale of a million tons of CO2 captured per year. And that, of course, is coming from an oil sands upgrader, but um, they are comparable. Um, so we we're actually going to see data being built, which will give um, the industry a lot of confidence. It's a very conservative industry. Give them a lot of confidence that this technology works. It won't break the bank. It'll cost, but it won't break the bank. And um, we can still uh, gain a lot from our uh, vast uh, fossil energy resource. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Carolyn, for your presentation. I'd like to think SAS Power again. I mean, one of the takeaways I've got from this is I'm very impressed with SAS Power, how they have worked with us so much on this and have been prepared to share the information. And I do commend them in the fact that they are setting up this consortium to share their knowledge and experience. And who knows, people interested in CCS could in the, in the next few years actually be pulling their staff onto the CCS plant at Boundary Dam to learn how to operate and that and learn on, you know, firsthand how to, uh, how to run, operate and build these plants. And I know SAS Power have thrown out a, a sort of come and work with us on Boundary Dam 3 and 4, so people who want to get inside information on how to construct, design and that these plants, uh, there's an opportunity there and I think that's brilliant for the CCS industry globally and I think that can only help CCS deployment in the long term. So I'll interject, I'll, I can sorry. interject John, 
Um, they, there's also Sass Power's new test facility at the Shand pa uh, Power Station as well. That's right, and it's one of three, the National Carbon Capture Centre and TCM Mongstad, all of which are helping incredibly by providing test beds for new and emerging capture technologies. And we all know that currently capture, the capture plant is probably the largest single component in terms of cost of these plants. So the learning we can generate from those and from operational plants like, like Boundary Dam is going to be key to the deployment of this technology in the future. Okay, at that point, I will end this. Thank you all for attending. Um, the presentation and the, uh, the video will be online shortly. Um, if you've got any other questions, please send them to us, and we'll, we'll get Carolyn to respond directly, and all this will be posted on our website in a short period of time. And we'll send a link out to you for the, uh, the, the video. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you.